All right, whether you decided months ago or maybe just this morning, we hope that you have had an opportunity to cast your vote or that you're able to get in before 8 o'clock tonight here in Minnesota. Tim Blotz and David Schultz are back now taking a closer look at how and when people decide who they're going to vote for. You know, seriously, I mean, one of the most perfect Complexing questions that candidates, the parties, political scientists like David all try to establish year in and year out, mm -hmm. especially during the presidential race, is how do voters decide? Yes. There's a robust set of data out there. And David, what I love about you <laughs> is every four years he assigns me new textbooks to read, right? <laughs> and I've got a bookshelf full of them at home. Okay. Um, and one of them is a book called The American Voter, That's right? right? And what this is, it's a summary of data that's been collected now for 75 years in yes. what's called the American National Voter Studies. Correct. Explain this. Okay, what it is, political scientists have been trying to build models. As I tell people, the task of political science, describe, explain, predict. Describe who voted, mm -hmm. why, for example, why they voted, and then to predict. And what we put together over time is an incredibly rich set of studies that surveys people every four years and tries to figure out why do people vote the way they do. So look at the data here. Like, and by the way, and you're going to bring back it, to Eisenhower. Yeah, back to Eisenhower. And you're going to point out here in a couple minutes here, this stuff, if you go to the University of Michigan, you go to the ANES, American National Election Studies, you can find this data yourself, and it's even set up in a way that you can crunch it yourself. You mm -hmm. can actually run some numbers. It's fabulous. And one of the things that they've established over the years is the researchers who study this data have put together a couple of predictive models, yes. okay? Yeah. What my grad school professor would call heuristic devices. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And this is one of them. It's called the funnel of causality. Yes. What makes people decide who they're going to vote for? And if you're looking at this and have a marketing background, okay, or come from the advertising world, you're going to look at this and say, oh, Tim, that's a marketing funnel. Yes. Very much the same thing. It is. It starts at the very top, and you've got the time continuum here over the left. So the very first time continuum starts at number one, and that's the socioeconomic demographics that your walk of life comes from. Right, David? Exactly. So what we're looking at here, for example, is what we're looking at. Okay, well, here, here, okay we'll get here. What yep. we're looking at here are things in terms of, let's say, your race, your education, your age. All the basic things that marketers already want to know. Because people who want to sell things to you want to know, are, are women, are men, are people who are more affluent or poor? What are their preferences in marketing? Mm -hmm. And we start here. And we have an incredible amount of data that tells us differences in voting behavior and decisions based upon these basic demographics. So this is the starting point in terms of, of our funnel here. But then once we go to that, as you have for the next one, it's party identification. And this is big. Yeah, Th that's yeah. a big determining factor. Yeah, it is at this point, because one of the things that we now know is that approximately 95% of Demo people who identify as Democrats vote for Democrats, 95% Republican, Republican. And so, so once we establish our demographics, party ID kicks in, but there's an interplay here too. Mm -hmm. Over time, for example, we used to see, for example, people who were college educated were much more likely to vote Republican and working class much more likely to vote Democrat. We're starting to see that shifting a little bit. So and demographics- we're gonna tease ahead to a half an hour and we're gonna talk about generational politics because exactly. that fits in perfectly. Yeah, so we're seeing some, some shifting here, but, but these are the first two important ones here. And I wanna add something else in here too. Yeah. There's actually a really good article, I think it was in the New York Times today that pointed this out. Um, also, is that social demographics also include region. Where, mm. we, where we live, where we also live. Um, and we have an overlay now. We have an overlay in here where region, social demographics, and party identification overlay along with marketing data. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that, we, you tell what me. What are consumers buying? What are, yeah. That tips you, their hand as to how they're gonna vote. Exactly, so you tell me what car you drive, where you shop, where you eat, what clothing you wear, I can make great predictions in terms of how you can vote. I'm gonna do some easy ones right now. It's really easy here. Yep. You tell me you drive a Subaru or a hybrid car, I know exactly how you vote. <laughs> if you tell me you go for your coffee at, at Dunkin' Donuts or at McDonald's, I know exactly how you vote at this sure. point. We have become what we consume. And so in some sense, I, I almost wanna say we need to add this new, sort of a new layer here or in terms of, in terms of our, our 
product preferences. Well, and the parties have these they data do. They sets do. too. In fact, they have actual programs now, because I've been out and done yes. stories with them. Mm -hmm. um, once upon a time, I think four years ago, yeah. I went out with a group of Republican canvassers, and they had on their iPad yeah. what homes on that particular block they needed to go to based upon consumer data that they know were likely going to be a prospective voter for them. Right, right. They so, can get that granular now. Yeah. It's at a point, at this point, you know who I think has the best data in America? Grocery stores. Mm -hmm. And I say that because you shop at Whole Foods, or you go to Cracker Barrel, or you go to Chick-fil-A. Those are really, really good predictors. Yeah, yeah, right. I was kidding with somebody recently in saying that if I really want to mine the best research in the country, tell me who and where you shop for groceries. And then we've got issues down there, but it yeah. comes further down yes. the scale here. And then people make very big decisions on the candidates themselves. Yes. So let's talk about those personality traits because the data over 75 years has come up with another heuristic on the four. Side, especially as a presidential candidate who they want to vote for. Mm -hmm. And it starts out with competence. Yeah, at the end of the day, we still want to feel like the person who's going to become president is qualified to do the job. And we have evidence over time that when people are deemed not to be competent um, by a sufficiently large percentage of the mm -hmm. population, that's a factor. I'm going to give kind of a great story here. Back in 2008, it was Obama versus McCain. And normally people don't pay attention to vice presidential candidates. Mm -hmm. But Sarah Palin was McCain's vice presidential candidate. But about 60% of the American public said, we don't think Sarah Palin is qualified to be president. And at that point, mm -hmm. people were concerned about McCain's health and age. There's evidence that because of that competence issue, it might have cost McCain a couple of points. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. And then we have effectiveness. So provides leadership, is inspiring, gets things done. Yeah, yeah. At the end of the day, there's evidence that Americans just want to get things done. They would rather have things done, even if they don't like what's being done, as opposed to the gridlock. And so somebody who's the doer, who's the mover, um, James McGregor Burns, a political scientist from a long, long time ago, once said that we like active, and I don't mean like physically active, but we like active presidents who are accomplishing and doing things. Mm -hmm. Then we have integrity. Yeah. Are they moral? Are they honest? Yeah. Okay? Yeah. And that, I have to believe, is playing out very strongly in this election. Absolutely correct here in terms of how people are judging the character, especially about Donald Trump at this point. Uh, and then again, you want to have the empathy one too, if you want to say something about that. Sure. Yeah. Empathy comes down here at the very bottom cares about me, is compassionate. Yeah. And, and that's an important s deciding structure for a lot of people. It is. It's, a, it's the relatability factor because there's a sense in which we used to say, do I feel like I could have a cup of coffee or a beer or something mm -hmm. like that with the candidate? But it's a sense of, do I feel like the candidate understands my predicament, who I am? Mm -hmm. And these are important. Now, it's also important to understand here, these are four. They're, they're not... We're not weighing them. We're not saying one counts 20%, one counts 30%. These but as a composite. Composite, yeah. Voters judge these four factors in the mixes that they find important to themselves. And I think there's one other important one here that the researchers didn't mention, but I really instinctively believe it's out there, and that is how does the candidate make me feel? And that goes back to the Ronald Reagan era. Yes. Where you didn't necessarily agree with President Reagan's politics. Right. But a lot of voters just liked him because yeah. they loved how they made them feel. Yes. And in fact, it, I think it was Sam Donaldson, ABC News correspondent, the White House correspondent, right. very famous at the time, who called Reagan the feel-good president. Yes. Yeah. And I think this is playing out in this election here. Okay. The way I describe it to my students is that, first off, to run for president, like any office, this is marketing. It's what you're selling a product. You've got to tell a story. Yeah. And watch a commercial, whether it's for cars or whatever, a story's being told. But generally what I want to say is stories that are positive, upbeat, that make people feel good, work well. Reagan's 1984 
commercial, which is considered the greatest of all time. His Morning theme, in America. Morning in America. Bill Clinton in 92 yeah. using Fleetwood Mac's Don't Stop Thinking About yeah. Tomorrow. I tell people, don't make me sing when I say this, by the way, <laughs> is that it all comes down to Annie. Annie yeah. from the musical. What's the most famous song? Tomorrow. Right. We as Americans like to be optimistic. Uh, we like to hope that tomorrow is a better day. Over the next hill, it's a better place. And so messages that inspire us, that make us feel good, that bring out hope. Hope that things are going to be better. FDR, we have nothing to fear but fear itself. Yes, right? exactly. Yeah. 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 Okay, so let's take a deeper dive here into the data. Um, we're going to talk about that here in a bit. What we're going to do is we are going to go now to some data sets here. Yes. And I love this because you talk about that feeling factor mm -hmm. that we just talked about with President Reagan. I'm going to bring this full screen here. This is data over 75 years here. Well, this set goes back to 1968. Right. Okay. And it's how the voters feel about the presidential candidates. I'm going to set all the way down here the very end and I'm going to sure. get out of the way and yeah. you can see just from four years ago you can see the blue line at the bottom Democrats candidates felt 48 percent in favor of their candidate Republicans the Republican candidate of course Donald Trump not so much and what I love about this is you can see the polarization taking place here and again this is all based upon interviews that the American National Electoral Studies has done right. with voters yes. post-election. That's right. They go down and they sit and they talk with them face to face to get this data. And you can see the dip. Now let's go back to Obama here, okay? He had some pretty high scores here. George Bush took a little bit of a dip, especially in his second run mm -hmm. in 2004. Granted, we had the war going on. That's right. There was That's a right. lot happening here. That's right. Okay, let's go back to Bill Clinton in 96 when he won there. Again, very wide support among the feel-good factor. And here, Reagan. Yeah. No one had a higher score than Reagan, 61%. Yeah. But Nixon did pretty good too. When he ran in, oh, let me get back here. Reset the zoom, Tim. <laughs> uh, yeah, I won't let me set, re there, there we go. go. We okay, it. so let's look at Richard Nixon. 66% yeah. when he ran in 1968. Again, he had he ran on having a secret plan to end the Vietnam right. War. Yeah. And the Vietnam War was very controversial right. at the time. Yeah. So a lot of voters had confidence in him to bring our boys back home. Yeah. If we think about political scientists like doing again prediction models, one of the things that we like to look at also, it sort of dovetails what you're saying here, in the second quarter of an election year, like this year, how do people feel about the president or the presidential candidate? And just to give you an idea, is that four years ago, at about, let's say, second quarter of this year, like April, May, June, there was about a 39% approval rating mm -hmm. for Donald Trump. Wound up losing. Biden this year was about the same position. And so if you have people, less than half the American public, liking you, uh, that's generally not a good sign. And you get down into the 30s, you know, upper 30s, that, that's usually fatal for you. Okay, so it brings up a really good point here, David. I wanna get out of this screen here, and I wanna show you how independents responded to the same likability. Yeah. Okay, view this full screen. Now, this is independents. Now, see where the independents broke here mm -hmm. in the last election four years ago? At the very end, they swung Democratic. Yes. By a large margin. Yes. Which would explain why Joe Biden um, was elected. He won those independent votes. Right. And he won them, as you're pointing out here, right near the end of the election when yeah. they're still trying to decide. Remember, think about our, our kind of pyramid. We also have to think, our pyramid, or f I call it a funnel actually myself. Yeah. As they're deciding, we get down to those few remaining undecided voters who are deciding in the closing days of the election, maybe even on election day, you want to look at how they break. This comes yeah. back to our discussion from before, is that polls may not be capturing that we see today yeah. what the undecided voters, those independent voters, were doing over the weekend or what they thought yesterday or today. Okay, now we're going to take a look at another set based upon these election studies over the years. And this is the two major parties. Yes. And this one is fascinating too because it shows, again, four years ago, 
how more people, especially Democrats, came out to vote in this particular mm -hmm. election and voted Democratic. And what I love about this is it shows, again, going back to 1948 here, right. and you can see the change elections taking place. You can see Ronald Reagan, okay? You can see Richard Nixon. You can see Eisenhower down there. Uh, yeah. I'm gonna hit the resume right. button here. And you can also see the change elections for mm -hmm. Democrats where the blue dips down, mm -hmm. okay? There's Kennedy yeah. in 1964. Um, you see it with Bill Clinton here and Barack Obama. So it's, um, it's a fascinating look over time. Mm -hmm. So let me get out of this one. We're gonna go to one more screen here. And this is the most telling of all because this one shows when people in the past have made their decision to vote for president, okay? Let's get over here to the last four years, okay, in 2020. And you can see down here that 68% knew all along who they were going to vote for. Knew all along. Yeah. More than any other past election in the past 75 right. years. Now, go all the way down to the bottom. Look down here. The number of people on the lower right who decided to vote for their candidate on election day, right. just 2%. Yeah, and we're looking at an election right now. If you look at some of those swing states, it's about 2% undecided, mm -hmm. and the polls are suggesting, and all those critical swing states, they're all within what? The margin of error. They're Which all is 2%. Percent. 2%. Two percent. They're almost identical. They're almost neck and neck in all these states. And so what people are doing on election day as they're walking into the ballot, if, by the way, if they decide to vote, that's also the critical thing is, yeah. is some people may decide to say, I'm not gonna vote. But among those who show up and vote, it's gonna happen today. It's happening right now. And in an election that is so close, we may not know because of the polling because people are making up a decision yeah. literally today. Right. Right. Yeah. It's going to be fascinating and why we're going to be here all night long and why, again, we may not know based upon um, the early voting that's coming in. We may not know for a couple of days, but we're going to be here all night long taking a look at just data like this. All right.